Could you please put the volume up? Good morning. I think medicine has been becoming a science fiction movie. There are so many examples for that. First thing first, we can print out customized prosthetics for that individual person. We can print out biomaterial, that's a bladder printed out in a 3D printing lab. We can print out liver tissues, kidney tissues, synthetic skin, bone cartilage, university by university. For years I've been saying that at some point we will print out drugs. And this summer, the first drug printed out with a 3D printer was approved by the FDA. That's, that's using a normal method of 3D printing, printing out layer by layer. So again, now we can print out drugs on demand. Only in one condition now, but that's going to change, obviously. Moreover, we have a scanner very soon that can tell us what we had for breakfast. Now you can only guess. But this scanner will tell us what exactly we are eating, what allergens, toxins or food contains. And that comes out to the market in Q1 next year. Moreover, this is a lung. That's the organ on a chip technique that can mimic the physiology of the human lung. And they will soon have one chip for the liver, the kidney, the heart. And they plan to connect all these up by the end of 2016 creating the first human physiological virtual model. So imagine that we will tell our kids that in the 2000 years, we tested drugs on patients. We gave drugs to some of them, we gave placebo to others, and tried to find a difference. That was a barbaric era in the early 2000 years. But with these, we could do clinical trials in silico, testing thousands of new drug molecules on billions of patient models with cognitive computers like Watson. For years, we've needed help in medicine, and now we finally get that help. When we need information, we get it immediately. In 1996, the IBM uh, Deep, Deep Blue supercomputer had a match with the reigning chess champion, Gary Kasparov, and of course, Kasparov could win that match. But one year later, in 1997, the computer could beat the best chess player in the world. And Kasparov had a very furious press announcement saying that that was not fair, because he, as a human, didn't have access to these massive databases. Since then, he has been organizing advanced chess championships in which the computer plays with the human player. They are one team. No one can beat them. So that's the jackpot combination. The utmost creativity of the human mind and computing power. For the last few years, the supercomputers have been used at different US clinics in oncology. So when the patient comes in, the doctor knows what information pieces are needed out of the 23 million studies out there and 1.5 million studies are added every year. So it's humanly impossible to be up to date. Therefore, we need help, and the help is already here. As science fiction is sneaking its way into medicine, I don't get this science fiction when I go to my doctor's office. That's not science fiction. And the reason why I think is that the technological evolution and the evolution of our behavior are changing, there's a huge gap between these. Before the 19th century, physicians had to put their ears to the naked chest or back of patient to listen to cardiac and lung sounds. And a French physician came up with this very brilliant idea that a wooden tube could augment this cardiac and lung sound, and it took him 20 years to get this message across to medical associations worldwide. Since then, the stethoscope has become the symbol of being a physician. If you have a stethoscope around your neck, you're a physician for sure. For the last two years, one of the world's top cardiologists, Tariq Topo, said that he hasn't even used his own stethoscope because, because there is a portable ultrasound in his pocket. And it's much better seeing the heart than listening to the heart lung cardiac sounds and draw conclusions from there. Moreover, before he listened to his patients and made decisions, now they watch the ultrasound together, they measure things together, and they can understand things together. So before it took hundreds of years to get the medical innovation into practice, then decades, now it takes years. Soon it will take months and weeks, and we are not really ready for that. If you take a look at the, the medical black bag of a doctor's office, a GP's office, you will find really strange things in there. A stethoscope that's almost 200 years old, you will find a, a blood pressure monitor that's about 130 years old. So 
or physicians are working with obsolete techniques when we use digital stuff in our everyday lives outside medicine. Therefore, this gap between the technological evolution and how we can change or mindset or behavior can change is getting bigger and bigger. In the black bag of Eric Topo, you will find these things. Digital stethoscope, digital uh, ultrasound, pocket ultrasound, smartwatches. They can measure everything, every health parameter in a small black, a small black bag in seconds, and everything is digital. You don't get the results on a paper like before. It's digital. It's compatible. You can obtain data about that patient. So it's getting there, but we are not there yet. I believe that no stakeholder of healthcare, from patients to physicians, researchers, developers, decision makers, no one is ready for what's coming next. And the problem is, a tsunami of technological changes is coming towards us. And I believe if these waves hit us unprepared, as we are now, it's going to wash away the medical system as we know it, making it a purely business-based service without any kind of human interaction. No one wants to let that happen. Even as a geek, I must say that we need the human touch. That's a major part of providing care. An algorithm might tell me what to do, or a health tracker might measure my parameters, but I need my physician's human touch. So I think that my theory is that with more and more better and better, cheaper and cheaper disruptive technologies, we will improve the human touch, only if we are prepared. And I believe only a few things are needed to get us prepared for this technological future. The first is very simple. Technology is just a tool, like the wooden stick before, just a tool. It depends on us whether it's bad or good. Um, when people tell me that technology makes us antisocial and um, we see this scene in bus stations, everyone checking their phones, we used to behave the same way before. It's just about technology. We make decisions about making that evil or amazing. That's part of our lives now. The second thing, without digital literacy, we have no chance. And by this I mean that, just like you, I face an ocean of information every day. That's far too much information to, to digest. So I have a few automatic methods based on which I can fill up just one swimming pool. That's still too much. I don't have that much time every day. So I have a glass, and that glass is my social media, my LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Google+, YouTube, blog networks, experts in my field. I have half a million assistants working for me every day, and it sounds good saying it out loud, just like how I work for them. But we are building a digital brain without any limitations to find the information that we actually need. The third thing is when they ask me about the future of healthcare, they expect me to come up with modern facilities and super equipment in hospital buildings. I don't think so. I think healthcare is coming home. With these health records and devices, these are coming home. If you take a look at a patient's case, they might, make, they might meet a medical professional for a few hours or days a year, but in the rest of the time, we are left alone. We are left alone at home. And that's the biggest, far the biggest part of our own healthcare. Just to give you one example, what if a microchip in the toilet could check our urine analysis, and that's existing already? What if a smart toothbrush could per persuade us to get a better oral hygiene? That's existing called Colibri. What if a digital mirror could tell us our blood pressure or stress levels or schedule? That's existing already. So all these things are out there, and they are coming to our homes. But the point is, as they are coming to our homes, very soon, in the middle of the healthcare system, there will be patients. Patients will be the kings of healthcare, the kings and the hackers of healthcare. So I'm working every day for this scenario. But for this, we need to put patients in the cockpit of their own health, health planes. For 2,000 years, there has been an ivory tower of medicine. Only physicians could access data and devices. But now, physicians and patients are in the same cockpit. They don't understand each other yet, but they can access data and you cannot improve a system if you cannot access data about that. For the last two or three years, now finally, we got this chance. So as a medical futurist, I thought that that's my mission. I need to be the lab mouse for people. I need to try everything, devices, health services, genomic tests, to tell you what's useful and what's useless medically and from the research point of view. I have been a guinea pig to, in upgrading my health. And that's been a, a real ride. Let me tell you I, how I have been upgrading my health for over a decade now. I started with sleep. I used a very simple French device to measure my sleep. I wear it on my wrist at night, and after five days, I learned a crucial thing about my life. Is that 
it doesn't matter for me how many hours I sleep for. What matters for me is if I have one long deep sleep period. That's quite crucial information. So I try to find the list of things I shouldn't do before going to bed in order to have a good night's sleep. And in a week, I was done. I'm having a good night's sleep every night now. But I couldn't wake up just like this. So I turned to the cheapest and simplest crowdfunded smartwatch, and I can tell that smartwatch, well, wake me up between 7, 7, 20, and find the best spot. It's its job. So it takes my movements, and when I'm in not in deep sleep anymore, but in light sleep, it wakes me up with one gentle vibration. No alarm sounds, no snooze function, one gentle vibration. I wake up like this. So two cheap assistants are working for me to have a good night's sleep. And I don't even use them anymore because I have the behavior change right now. That was one thing. The second thing was physical activity. I use a US American device to make sure I know how many steps I take a day. After a week, I found out if I have more than 10,000 steps, I'm going to function mentally much better the next day. So it's simple. I need to exercise every single day. And that's my physical assistant. But to be honest with you, I hate running. And I need gadgets to motivate myself to go out for a run. So when I found this other assistant of mine that I wear on my chest strip, it measures my pause, many parameters, and through my smartwatch, it tells me when to slow down during running sessions, when to pump it up. I have a talk in the evening, so slow down now. It's my assistant, and it motivates me to go out for a run. And again, since I had this new behavior, I don't use them anymore. I went on checking for new devices. With this one, I can measure my electrocardiogram. Not on a huge device, an expensive one, this small one. It works with any smartphones. It analyzes my electrocardiogram with smart algorithms. I can even ask US experts to give an, give an analysis about my EKG live in a few hours. And now I have this in my hand. And I went on looking for new devices. This blood pressure monitor can check my blood pressure in half a minute. There is one button called Start. You can't even make a mistake here. And you get all the data on your smartphone. So moving on, I use devices that can measure everything at once. Body temperature, uh, blood pressure, electrocardiogram, sleep, uh, pulse, uh, daily activities, like a medical tricorder. I play games on Lumosity, backed by neuroscience, to improve my cognitive skills. Um, I listen to music at Focus at Will to be able to focus, because these, music, these kinds of music are generating the best potential brain activity in your mind. I can get immediate feedback about my brain activities, whether it's active or neutral or calm during my meditation sessions. I learned how to relax myself when I really want to relax. I've got all these in my hands right now. I can measure my stress levels, and it makes me stressed to find out by this that I'm more stressed than my wife. But now I'm working on that by the help of the application. I've had genomic tests. I, I learned what kind of mutations I have, what conditions I, have in, I might have in the future, what I should know about the future of my own health so I can prepare. I had my microbiome tested, the eight kilogram, kilograms of bacteria living in my digestive system. Now I know what I live with, how they affect my diet, my sleep activity, my meditation sessions. I know my body because I could get things measured from home. I have my genome sequence because I measure that from home. All patients have these potentials and opportunities now. They can measure whatever they want. That's the freedom that finally we can access our own data from home. The point is, in five years, we will laugh at all these devices, these big, clunky devices. I will open up a museum showing these first devices to people. We will have digital tattoos, things that can measure all our vital signs and health parameters, and they let us know when there is something we should take care of, when it's time, not me trying to find the best solution for my health parameters. We will have devices attached to smartphones that can detect malaria, that can do a urine analysis at home, so we will access even the clinical laboratory from home. Although, I don't think that healthcare is going to be changed from the top to the bottom by organizations and governments and companies. I believe we can change it from the bottom to the top, individual by individual. Physician, researcher, patient, developer, decision maker, one by one. So through the ways for the last dec decade I've been trying to improve my job or through the ways I've been trying to live a healthier life by upgrading my health with technologies, I like to believe that I've been trying to change healthcare from the bottom to the top. And I hope that you will join me in this battle. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bertalon. And I've got a question for you.
It's less technological but more social question. Huh. It's less technology but more social question. You're absolutely right. The industry is moving direction to the patient. The patient or the person is going to be at the very center of health care decisions. And there is a thin line right now. Where is the border? Because when we are talking about these technical devices, most of those devices are for healthy people. I know there are some experience to use as part of those devices in the clinical practice, but nevertheless, the most of devices sold and used by healthy people. Because healthy people have enough mental power and self confirmness to take some decisions about their own health. What about people who are sick? What about people who are patients? Are they ready to give responsibility for their own health and for the clinical decision from them to the, to the doctors? Or are they ready to take them by itself, the clinical decisions? What's your experience? You make an excellent point here. The reason why it has been like this is that companies found a driving, business driving force from healthy people who would have the money, who would have the motivation to live a healthier life, and they, they are happy to measure anything about their own health. But the point is, it becomes really useful when we can put these devices into the diagnostic processes mm -hmm. and then therapeutics. Mm -hmm. And now there are only one, two, three examples in both why there are hundreds of devices out there for healthy people. What matters is, I think now we are building a pyramid. And on one side we have healthy and diseased people who, have a bet who should have a better mm -hmm. demand towards mm -hmm. companies. On the other side, we have companies building better technologies if the demand is big enough. Mm -hmm. Right now, we have the building blocks out there, but nobody's building that pyramid. So I feel like that's my mission to connect them up. If there are better demands from healthy people towards companies, mm -hmm. they, will start, they will start feeling that they have the business driving force towards building better things for people with medical conditions as well. But we need to start somewhere. And these are, again, funny stuff out of the first years of this health record revolution. So the, at the end of the day, you believe that the person would be ready, would be ready to take responsibility for self-diagnosis and making clinical decisions how to treat itself. That shouldn't be self-diagnosis. If you ask empowered patients, none of them will tell you that they want to become doctors. Mm -hmm. They will tell you that they, they want to get this freedom that they are able to measure things about their health, mm -hmm. but they will need their professional, their medical professional, to help make a decision with. Right now, it's a godlike rule. Physicians will tell patients what to do. That's how we are trained. Mm -hmm. But soon it's going to be a shared medical decision-making process in which they are, in, they are equal partners on the same level. They can discuss things. Patients are are experts about their own health, mental, physical, emotional health, but physicians are experts about their own medical profession. Okay. And then together they can find the best solutions. Okay, I think we have to put our hands together. Uh, sorry, one more.